Sarah Coates, and this is Global Eye, your window to the world straight from Tel Aviv. Now, we're going to be travelling around the globe for the next hour together to give you every story you need to know. Well, on tonight's show, groundbreaking technology looks like it could change the lives of people around the globe who've been paralysed. We'll bring you that incredible story. Well, he was banned from social media, but former US President Donald Trump is back with his own platform. So is it worth downloading? And we'll bring you a daring escape on a motorised suitcase. But did they get away with it? But before we get into any of that, let's start right here in Israel. What's the buzz? These are today's most trending stories. Well, Israel is stepping up its defence against a possible attack from Iran, successfully launching a new naval rocket defence system from this ship here, coming in a time of heightened tension in the region. Well, the Sea Dome, as it's known, is similar to the Iron Dome, which is deployed when rockets are launched at Israel from the Gaza Strip, which is now said to be incorporated into Israel's multi-layer defence system, with test being called another historic milestone. Well, it was only last week when Hezbollah flew drones into Israeli airspace, which were shot down by the military. Israel has for the first time appointed a Muslim and a Mizrahi woman as Supreme Court judges, reordering the 15 justice body at the top echelon of the judicial branch. Well, as it stands now, women make up about one third of the judges in this position, with today's appointment following months of delays due to disagreements among committee members. Former Israeli Prime Minister and current opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu is speaking out on the Iran nuclear deal as talks to revive the 2015 accord continue in Vienna, saying U.S. policy is weak. Well, Tehran's demands that those talks with world powers are said to include delisting of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards as a terror organisation. Well, Netanyahu speaking exclusively to the I-24 News show Mideast Now about the way he handled the Iranian threat, the way the current coalition government is dealing with the same issue and Israel's changing relationship with the US. We're, we're the first target, but every, the rest of the world is merely the next target. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, uh, you know, the, the important thing is what is the right policy and what is the wrong policy, not who's doing it. You know, when I uh, saw American uh, uh, administrations over the years adopt policies that I thought were inimical or dangerous to my country, I opposed them. Sometimes they were Republican, sometimes they were Democrats. So I think the issue is not the identity of the uh, administration, but the policies. And the policy now, I think, is weak. And the right policy, from Israel's point of view, should be to speak out against it. Look, I went, Laura, to the U.S. Congress to speak out against a sitting American president. I didn't do that lightheartedly. I knew that I was doing something unprecedented. But I knew the survival of my country, and in my opinion, the survival of many countries was at stake. So I did it. I spoke at UN forums. I spoke on endless television interviews. I did everything I could to mobilize the Senate and the Congress uh, against this, what I thought was a dangerous agreement for the U.S., for Israel, and for everyone else. Uh, that's what I think should be done now. If it'll be done now, people will pay attention. Nobody will be more pro-Israel than the Israelis themselves. No one will be more passionate, uh, more committed than Israel itself. So we have to communicate that passion, that commitment, that uh, willingness to face these threatening odds, however dreadful. Uh, and if we do it, others will follow. You yes. only They only follow if you lead. It looks like a deal with Iran might be imminent, uh, according to reports coming out of Vienna. Uh, what, is, what is your advice then to, to those taking part in the negotiations? Walk away? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I said that to them all the time. Or demand a better deal. A deal that doesn't, that uh, forces Iran to dismantle its nuclear, uh, its military nuclear infrastructure, that doesn't let them develop their ballistic missiles to deliver a weapon that stops weapon development, that stops terror, that ties the progress in lifting restrictions on Iran to Iran's behavior, not to the change of calendar, which is what this deal does. So I, I think, yes, that's what I would advise. But again, I would say that from my point of view as the 
uh, uh, having been the Prime Minister of Israel against these kinds of deals for a long time, the most important thing to say is, with a deal or without a deal, Israel must do what it needs to do to defend itself against the threat, this ex extraordinary threat to its existence and its future. Moving on, and with the Beijing Winter Olympics now wrapped up, much of the attention here in Israel hasn't been focused on the fact that the country's athletes didn't win any medals but their achievements. Well, a small but proud team have left China and are now focusing their attention on training and the future. And Vladislav Bekhanov joins us now. Vladislav, rather, nice to see you. Uh, you're a short Hi. track speed skater. Thanks for coming on. Look, uh, no medals, but it seems you guys really dug in, took it all in your stride. Uh, tell me about the Games. Well, uh, uh, super proud uh, to go to Olympic Games. Of course, uh, it's our uh, biggest stage uh, uh, we can perform on. And uh, yeah, it was amazing to be there. Even though uh, uh, Corona happened, the uh, uh, Chinese did a great job arranging uh, everything and uh, everything went through. So uh, yeah, super happy to, uh, uh, to be able to be there and uh, represent Israel for the third time. Yeah, nice. So, you know, normally these games, you'll see a lot of spectators, as you were mentioning, you know, the COVID situation. But you guys yeah. were sort of robbed of that this time. What was it like, you know, being there at the games in these, what they were calling COVID bubbles? Yeah, it's a bit of a shame because at the Olympics you get uh, it's such a it's such a huge stage and so many people are coming into the stadium and watching the competition. It's like it's amazing noise and 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 a thrill before uh, start starting each race. Uh, and now it was kind of a yeah, it didn't feel like this amazing uh, uh, huge stage we were on uh, at the moment in the stadium. It was uh, kind of calm and and uh, yeah not so many fans uh, only a few a few i think a couple of hundred uh, uh, chinese uh, fans uh, were were at the, at the stadium so yeah that was a bit weird yeah and, and tell me you know what are your goals now moving forward now the games have all wrapped up well we still have a uh, world championships in about a month uh, i hope those are not going to be cancelled because yeah you never know with corona uh, how it is uh, yeah, these days, uh, hope I hope that's gonna happen. Uh, yeah, we're still all fit and uh, and they're ready to race, but that's gonna be great uh, if it's gonna happen. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm planning to keep on uh, representing Israel in uh, in this sport. Uh, I hope for uh, as many more years as possible, as long as my body uh, can take it and my my mental uh, game is still there. <laughs> and, and tell me, you know, how was the Israeli team welcomed there? And also. Tell me about, you know, the feeling when you left and what sort of reactions you got following that. Yeah, I think we were welcomed uh, well, as uh, same as uh, all, uh, all the other teams uh, uh, arriving there. So uh, didn't feel anything weird about that. I think the Chinese are doing a great job. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome everybody the same and uh, le letting everybody feel welcome. Uh, so that was good. Uh, yeah. And oh, what no, was your sort uh, of biggest, what was the biggest highlight for you there at the Games? What would you, you know, if, when people were asking you what you loved the most, what would you say to them? Um, it would be yeah, kind of hard, hard to describe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, being able to race in the first place, uh, it was great uh, having that opportunity. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, the racing at the Olympics, it's always a, a great uh, mixed feeling. There's a lot of uh, your excitement, a lot of fears yeah. uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, doing well, your best. Uh, yeah. Well, Vladislav, thank you so very much for coming on, and uh, we wish you good luck for the future. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, we're taking you out for a short break, but when we get back, Trump's own media platform is live on the Apple Store. We'll take a look at it and tell you just how popular it's been on its first day and what caused this inferno on a passenger ferry travelling from Greece. Authorities are still searching for missing people with fears a death toll could rise. We'll bring you both those stories and plenty more coming right up. Don't go anywhere.
hasn't seen a war for decades. But signs are that one is just around the corner. Join I-24 News as we land in Kyiv and make our way to the eastern border with Russia. Talking to people on the ground, caught up in Europe's unfolding war. Starting February 15th, only on I-24 News. Breaking news again, but there's always more to the story, especially here in the Middle East. What's really going on in the region? Well, unless you're actually here, you can't really tell. Join us here at the beating heart of the new Middle East to get a true perspective on what's really going on. We're on the inside of political and religious passions in Jerusalem, breaking down the financial trends shaping the global economy, giving you key context, not just headlines, with the stories from Israel that touch the U.S. and those across the region with impact far beyond its borders. Catch the rundown where the Middle East meets the world. of a jet crash in Iran. The U.S. built F-5 aircraft plowing into the wall of a school just before 9 a.m. this morning, killing three people. Authorities say no children were inside the facility at the time. The pilot and trainee pilot among the dead, along with a civilian who was passing by in a car. Now, at this stage, it appears a technical failure may have caused the crash, with Iran having a poor air safety record, in part because it can't buy spare parts for airplanes from the US since their diplomatic ties were severed back in 1980. Now, many people in Saudi Arabia and Egypt are facing a dire, bone-chilling winter season, living in conditions you're seeing here as one of the most brutal winters is upon them, the situation even further compounded by COVID. Now, many homes don't even have a roof, running water or sanitation, with some families reportedly earning just $50 per month. Now, rare snowstorms have been hitting many coastal towns over the past few months, with families lining up for things most of us take for granted, like blankets and basic supplies. Well, Mount Hermon in the north of Israel is known as the eyes of the state. Well, those who visit can clearly understand why the military outpost at the top of the mountain overlooks the entire area, which is beautiful and dangerous at the same time. Our defence correspondent Jonathan Regev has this report. The scenery is stunning. The snow so white and majestic. You can easily think you're in the Swiss Alps, but the little fence just meters away is a reminder that this is actually a dangerous border area. We're on the highest man outpost in the state of Israel, overlooking Syria. 20 meters behind us is already Syrian territory. Mitzpe Shlagim is the Hebrew name of this outpost, meaning snow observatory. It's easy to understand how it got its name, but for the soldiers here, this is far from a sightseeing trip. They're well aware of what might happen if they fall asleep on guard. We cannot let this beautiful scenery and the snow that we see all around confuse us because if it happens, we will be at risk and our enemy will take advantage of that. Outdoors, it is of course different than any other place in Israel, but indoors, the base is similar to many others around the country and so is the activity in it. We spend most of our day training, whether it's close combat, fitness training, close contact engagement and anything else needed for readiness. Anything needed for readiness means the shooting ranges, among other activities, and the snow will surely not stop that. 
The snow doesn't bother us. Our soldiers know how to deal with the enemy in these conditions. They hit well and are well aware of how to conquer the targets, even in the snow. Right down below, as mentioned, is Syria. Today, a struggling country following more than a decade of a bloody civil war, but in the past, a mighty enemy who had its military success right here on this mountain. Just across the hill, behind the clouds, stands the other Israeli outpost on the mountain. It's the same outpost conquered by Syria on the first day of the Yom Kippur War in October 1973 and recaptured by Israel after an extremely difficult battle on the last day of the war. It may have happened nearly half a century ago, but the story is ever present here. It's in our mind all the time. We bring people who fought here back then who tell us the story of what happened there and how the outpost was conquered. We heard so many stories about what happened here and the fact that so many Israeli soldiers were killed in order to keep our presence on this mountain. It tells us why it's so important for us to be here. The Syrian army may not be the same powerful enemy of the past, but a short distance to the west stands the Lebanon border, and the enemy waiting there is far more dangerous. Just this past weekend, Hezbollah was able to fly an unmanned aerial vehicle into Israeli territory and then back to Lebanon, despite Israeli efforts to bring it down. It means that this place, and the nickname given to it, are not only tasked with watching Syria, but with watching Lebanon as well. These are the eyes of the State of Israel. When you come up here, you can see the entire area, all of northern Israel, southern Lebanon and Syria. You absolutely feel how important it is for us to be here on this mountain. Syria and Lebanon on one hand, the Mount Hermon ski resort on the other, and in between stands the snow observatory outpost with its very unique conditions, responsible for keeping this very sensitive area as safe and beautiful as it looks. Well, moving on, and the largest hydro plant in Africa has started operating, aiming to provide much-needed electricity for the continent's second largest country, Ethiopia. But the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is highly controversial. Our Middle East correspondent Alec Pollard explains. A push of a touchscreen button, and on it goes, finally. After more than a decade of construction, the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam is producing its first watts of electricity to a country where most of the population of 110 million don't have access to this vital service. Ethiopia's only desire is to provide power to the 60% of Ethiopians in need of electricity, to the mother who has never seen a light bulb. But this mega project is not seen in that light by Ethiopia's northern neighbors. Both Sudan and Egypt have expressed fierce opposition to the hydro plant due to its potential effect on the vital lifeline of both countries, the Nile River. Egypt has even in the past threatened to bomb the dam. Ethiopian officials claim these fears are unwarranted. This dam is really a blessing, for, especially for Sudan, because they don't need to construct big dams. It's a regulated flow which comes to their dam every year, so it's a blessing for them. But I don't know. It is even a blessing for uh, Egypt. But negotiations between the sides on how to manage and operate the dam fell apart back in April 2021. Ethiopia's second phase of filling the dam for the necessary electrification back in July was completed without Egypt and Sudan's agreement. So far, only one of 13 turbines producing just 375 out of over 5,000 planned megawatts of electricity is operational. Trilateral negotiations concerning further progress are planned, but Ethiopians are determined to proceed no matter what the outcome. It's going. I humbly call on our brothers in Egypt and Sudan to stand together for mutual benefit instead of wasting their time, energy and money in trying to thwart this project. Ethiopia celebrated the dam's operation as a national victory over external forces trying to shut it down. Thus, along with the technical challenges, serious political hurdles will need to be overcome for Africa's largest hydro plant to operate at full capacity. And we're moving on to the United States. These are today's most trending stories. 
Well, as Omicron has battered the health system in the US, it has too caused major shortages of staff, leading to the National Guard to be deployed. Soldiers seen here carrying out nursing training to help alleviate the strain on hospitals. Never in my wildest dreams would I, you know, live through a pandemic and then helping out the communities in this capacity in any way, shape or form. But, you know, it was a great opportunity that this is happening and I'm happy that I'm all able to help out my community in any way that they need. But it's certainly not a long term solution to the growing problem with the soldiers only contracted until mid March with healthcare workers hoping their contracts will be extended to give them a little more breathing space. Well, COVID has thrown Justin Bieber's tour into chaos with the 27-year-old testing positive to the virus, forced to cancel a show in Las Vegas, with his reps confirming there's been an outbreak within his team. Now, Bieber's manager seemingly joking about how he caught it, hinting at the idea that he may have picked up the virus at the Super Bowl last week. Well, the 27-year-old is reportedly feeling well and is resting up at home with his show being rescheduled to happen now in June. Now, remember when former US President Donald Trump was kicked off Twitter? Well, he's back with his own social media venture to launching today on the Apple Store. Well, Truth Social, as it's known, was the top free app this morning, although some users are already reporting problems, saying they're having trouble downloading the app or that they've been added to a waiting list. Well, Trump was banned from Twitter, Facebook and YouTube after the US Capitol riot in January 2021, with the new app backed by other Republicans, as a number of tech companies position themselves as champions of free speech. Well, the platform is expected to be fully operational by the end of next month. And joining us now live from New York is our senior U.S. correspondent, Mike Wagenheim. Good evening, Mike. Uh, tell us, what is this platform exactly? Well, we're not going to know for a while exactly what this platform is or where it's heading, but we know what it looks like, and it looks very much, unsurprisingly, like Twitter. That's Donald Trump's favorite platform. That's what he became famous for. <laughs> so it looks an awful like it. And, and not surprisingly, the coding for this uh, app was taken from Mastodon, which is a sort of an open source uh, a social network umbrella, which was taken uh, as an alternative to Twitter. So we're right back at square one for Donald Trump. There are a few differences in name only. Instead of liking something, it's called a truth. Not a like, but a truth. <laughs> Instead of a retweet, it's a retruth. And instead of a news feed, it's a truth feed. You're yeah, shock horror. <laughs> and tell me, Mike, who can get access to this app? Well, <laughs> very few people right now. <laughs> Number one, it's only available on iOS at the moment, not on my lonely uh, Android. It'll be available apparently in another uh, month or so on Androids. But right now, as you mentioned, there are all sorts of uh, problems uh, downloading the application. A lot of people getting error messages. Uh, you can't get a verification email. Others are complaining about. Some are being put on these lengthy, lengthy waiting lists of hundreds of thousands of people. So very few have actually gotten on the application. So far, the rollout, obviously, a, a bit suspect at this point in time. However, those running Truth Social say... It's all going to be fixed in due time. What about regulations? Are there any on this new app, Mike? Well, the point of this was to no censorship, to open things up to everybody and anybody. There's no regulation of content. The one rule is, if you look through the rules of service, that fine print, you're not allowed to criticize Truth Social. Don't criticize a platform <laughs> where you can be kicked off. Now, reportedly, they did incorporate some artificial intelligence to police the post, not exactly sure at this point how thorough that's going to be and if content is going to be removed, but that was the pledge originally from Donald Trump and company. This is for everybody, no censorship, everybody's welcome, even though it's obviously geared more toward the right-wing conservative base that Donald Trump has uh, collected over the last five years. So I'm guessing, Mike, if it is Trump's own platform... There's no way he's going to be able to get kicked off this one too, is there? <laughs> no, highly <laughs> unlikely that uh, Trump is going to be kicked off. But the, the question is, how much are they going to rely on Trump for posting? How much are they going to rely on Trump for content? Is the network 
self-sufficient enough to run off of its users yeah. rather than the leader of the organization here in Donald Trump. That's going to be the big test. Is it all Trump? Or is it something new? Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Mike Wagenheim, it's always lovely to see you. Thanks for coming on. Have a great night. You All right, too. we're taking a short break. But when we come back, a breakthrough in science could spell the end of paralysis in people. We'll take you live to the man behind the study with the remarkable treatment of one crash survivor and a major arrest down under cops closing in on a fugitive who's been on the run for the last 12 years. Both those stories and plenty more coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Discover I-20 for News Radio. Now you can listen to I-20 for News anywhere, anytime, for free. I-20 for News Radio is the audio live stream of the television network with world headlines every 30 minutes starting from 7 a.m. Tune in for top news, magazines, editions, while in the car, in your office. Join us from your smartphone, tablet, or desktop to stay connected in the Middle East and around the world. Don't wait any longer. Head to our website or mobile application and click on I-20 for News Radio to subscribe. Today I'll make knafe. It's an Arab dessert made of thin noodle-like pastry, goat cheese, clarified butter, and sugar syrup. In most cases, the orange on top of the pastry comes from food color, but we do it the natural way, from carrots, beetroot, or rose petals. The kind of knafe we make originates from Nablus. Legend says it was first made for one of Islam's greatest leaders who visited Nablus. He was known as a man who enjoyed food, and in honor of his presence, knafe was made especially for him. This place was opened by my father and two brothers 31 years ago. We chose the village of Abu Ghosh because this is where we were born and raised. The history of the Abu Ghosh clan goes way back. The first Abu Ghosh leader arrived here with his family in 1520, and until today the village population consists of four main families who are his descendants. When my father opened this place, there were very few shops or restaurants. Most of them were hummus places. We wanted to do something different, and that's when my father came up with the idea of knafe. Today I run this place with my brother. I think the special thing about our shop is the freshness of the knafe, which is very important. The natural ingredients we use, and most of all, our approach to clients, our smiles. It's more important than any dish or recipe. <laughs> the sound bites and beyond the numbers zoom in between the people and into the middle east conflict i'm jeff smith together we'll zoom in sunday through thursday nights only on i24 news in 2022 i24 news continues to grow with you. Join the friends of I24 News and enjoy exclusive benefits. A welcome gift, special offers, and invitations to special events organized by the channel. Also included is a subscription to our live and replay services. Don't wait any longer and join the friends of I24 News. More information on www.i24news.tv. staying with
with us. Well, Storm Franklin has lashed the United Kingdom, bringing with it devastating flooding to a number of towns, like here in Matlock, where roads have become rivers. Well, Franklin is the third such storm to hit Britain in the last week, with more than 140 flood warnings in place across both England and Wales, with people being urged to avoid those areas. Weather officials say the storm is expected to start moving away from the country later on today, just a matter of days after Storm Eunice killed three people and left 1.4 million homes without power. Now, this is what remains of a passenger ferry that caught on fire en route from Greece to Italy, claiming the life of at least one passenger. Well, at least 10 people are still unaccounted for, with the Coast Guard saying they're all Bulgarian, Turkish and Greek nationals, with relatives seen here standing on the dock anxiously waiting for news. Well, there were almost 200 people on the ferry when it caught fire, many of them truck owners or drivers transporting goods through Europe. Now, the cause of the blaze still is being investigated, with a prosecutor launching a probe. Well, Air France is just the latest airline to cancel flights in and out of Kiev amid growing tension with Russia, with fears an invasion by Moscow is imminent. Well, the carrier announcing the move today, releasing a statement saying monitoring the geopolitical situation at it, the territories it serves. Now, it comes on the back of Lufthansa also suspending flights to Kiev and the Ukrainian city of Odessa until the end of the month, sparked by the mass Russian troop buildup on Ukraine's borders, with the airline saying the safety of our passengers and crew members is our top priority at all times. All right, now to breaking news. And Vladimir Putin has signed a decree recognising two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine as independent entities up in the ante in a crisis the West fears could unleash a war. Now, the Russian president making a statement in a televised address to the nation following a signing ceremony with the heads of the two breakaway republics in the Kremlin. Well, in an earlier phone call with the German Chancellor and the French President, Putin reaffirmed, reaffirmed rather that he would do this anyway, while the two European leaders expressed their disappointment with the move. Well, the European Union is warning of sanctions from the 27-nation bloc should Moscow annex or recognise the breakaway regions in the east of Ukraine. The EU's foreign policy chief says if there's an annexation, there will be sanctions. Batia Levinthal looks at whether a diplomatic solution is still possible. In the morning, hope of a resolution to the crisis through a summit. In the evening, rumours of an impending Russian action which bring war that much closer. The day began with hope for dialogue over dispute. This seemed to be the order of the day between America and Russia over the Ukraine crisis. U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin have agreed in principle to meet. The announcement coming after two lengthy phone calls between French President Emmanuel Macron and his Russian counterpart. The Kremlin says the talks are still premature. We hope, of course, as human beings, as someone who desperately wants to avoid the war, we hope that two presidents will walk out uh, from the room with an agreement. President Putin made it clear several times that we are not against summits or meetings. But before the meetings in such a heated environment, we need to know how these meetings can end and what the result will be. It's a possible window of diplomatic resolution. But it comes as Russian troops continue to amass on the east of the Ukrainian border while U.S. troops in Poland are closing in on the West. Inflaming the tensions is also this. As evening fell, rumours arose that Russia was about to recognise separatist-held areas, something Putin had hinted at earlier in the day. Our goal is to listen to our colleagues and determine our next steps in this direction. Bearing in mind both the appeals of the leaders of the Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic to recognize their independence. Russian recognition of these two areas would inevitably mean war. The soldiers are at the ready. The summit is supposedly being set, but are either side really prepared for the go? Either way, the time for dialogue and a peaceful solution is running out. But the tension-filled hourglass is not done just yet. 
leaving just enough breathing room for a bit of optimism. Moving now to an exciting new scientific breakthrough with a man who was paralysed in a motorbike accident back in 2017, regaining the ability to walk again. The technology has been developed by professors at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, led by Professor Andreas Rowald, implanting electrodes in his spine to reactivate the muscles. Well, he is now able to stand, ride a bike and even swim with the electrical stimulation controlled via a tablet. Well, it's exceptional news for people who've lost the use of their limbs, with researchers saying... Thanks to this technology, we've been able to target individuals with the most serious spinal cord injuries. And Dr. Andreas Roel joins us now from Germany. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on. What an achievement. Firstly, walk us through how exactly this technology works. Yes, good evening. Um, it's actually, although it's quite complicated, we can kind of summarize it in a very simple manner. Um, essentially, in your spinal cord, uh, you have all the neural circuits that are necessary to produce movement, and they're just dormant because the communication to the to the brain has been disrupted due to the to the spinal cord injury. And all we're really trying to do is we're trying to apply electrical stimulation to artificially reawaken these circuits. So we implant electrodes right on top of the spinal cord, right on top of the area where all this movement is, is happening in the spinal cord. And then in a very precise manner, we target very individual neurons that then enable ultimately the movement to occur. So the real work is essentially happening prior to the, to the patient ever arising, uh, arriving. Um, in, in, in the clinic, and we generate computational models of this patient to a priori know exactly what we have to do. And then we implant these electrodes and we put very, very precise electrical impulses into the spinal cord to then produce very specific movements that ultimately produce, for example, a walking pattern or a swimming pattern or a cycling pattern. How wonderful. That's very roughly already everything. Yeah, so, you know, this guy, he hadn't been able to walk or stand up since 2017, as I mentioned. Tell me a little bit about his reaction, you know, when, when he did. I mean, of course, it was a, an incredibly emotional uh, moment uh, for for the uh, the individual as well as for the entire team. I remember that we all had uh, tears in in our eyes when it uh, when we when we saw what we uh, what we were capable of doing, and of course for him, um, what he's capable of doing, because this is of course a function that he he didn't have in in such a long period of time, and then just to take that first step. I think was was overwhelming for him just as much as it was overwhelming for us. It must have been really amazing. And tell me, you know, Doctor, how long can we really expect this to take until it is more widely used, you know, to really help so many people around the world? Mm -hmm. So I would say that a reasonable estimation is to have sort of the first therapy available in clinics across the world in approximately four to six years from now. Um, and then from there on out, we will have to do a lot more in order to optimize it, to scale it, to bring it to more clinics, clinics, and of course, to bring it also to other pathologies besides spinal cord injury and other functionalities than just walking. But I would say for walking and spinal cord injury, it's reasonable to, to uh, think we'll have this in four to six years. Wow. Well, you've done an absolutely incredible job. You know, so many lives around the world are about to change. You know, I, I cannot imagine being, you know, forced into a wheelchair or not being able to walk or run. So this is just absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for what you're doing and also for your time tonight. Well, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Our pleasure. Thank you. All right, we're taking you out for a short break, but when we come back, Australia has finally reopened its borders after a two-year closure. We'll take you down under and a daring getaway on a motorised suitcase. We'll have both those stories coming right up here on Global Eye. Don't go anywhere.
Esta semana en News 24, Estados Unidos y Rusia chocan por Ucrania en un flashback que nos devuelve a la Guerra Fría. Israel Startup Nation, de Israel al mundo. La Autoridad Nacional de Innovación promueve iniciativas y alianzas tecnológicas con América Latina. Y Ronnie Majlis, con su emprendimiento Ticuno, potencia los proyectos de innovación israelí. News 24, el magazine semanal en español de i24 News. Strictly Security, your weekly look into security, intelligence, and strategic affairs. Our team brings the latest on the major international conflicts, analysis of the major security issues right here in the Middle East and around the globe. Join us for a close look at innovative military technology and get up to speed with what's happening in cyberspace. Saturdays, only on I-24 News. The Middle East. I-24 News is a witness. Our journalists live and breathe there every day. Get all the latest global news from our studios in Tel Aviv, New York, Washington, and Paris. Anytime, anywhere. Download the I-24 News app, available on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple, and Google stores. I-24 News. See beyond. If you think you've seen a snowstorm, just check out this one in Hokkaido in the north of Japan. Well, it was reportedly brought on by a rapidly developed low-pressure system and strong winds, dumping heavy snowfall with some areas seeing at least 50 centimetres of snow, causing major disruptions to public transport, seeing roads closed and hundreds of flights cancelled as authorities warn people to stay on high alert. Well, what you're about to see here is the arrest of Australia's most wanted man, Graham Potter, who was found in this squalid room, ending a 12-year hunt for him. Well, cops moving into the Queensland property where Potter was hiding out before putting him in handcuffs and taking him into custody. Now, the 64-year-old was wanted on a Victoria state warrant for conspiracy to murder since 2010 after failing to appear in court and then disappearing. Well, he has now been extradited to Victoria and will appear in court tomorrow. North Koreans fleeing isolation, food shortages, brutal dictatorship have been well documented. 10,000 in the past decade came to South Korea. That's according to official figures. But what about the handful who chose to flee the other way, back into North Korea, just some 30 over the same time span. Well, CNN's Paula Hancock speaks to a young defector in Seoul who still questions if she's made the right decision and a mother who says she would fly to Pyongyang tomorrow if she could. Fleeing North Korea is dangerous. As this desperate dash across the DMZ in 2019 showed, Oh Chong Song was shot by fellow North Korean soldiers as he crossed to the South Korean side. He survived. Most defections are far less dramatic, but no less risky. Travelling through China to a third country, China sends those they catch back to North Korea and almost certain punishment, which makes the rare decision to voluntarily return to North Korea all the more surprising, an indication of how hard life can be for defectors even in South Korea. I think that the best way that North Korean defectors have described it to me is that going from North Korea to South Korea is like coming out of a time machine, like 50 years in the future. <laughs> Kang Nara is considered a defector success story. A television personality and YouTuber, 318,000 subscribers for videos like this one. Must have items for escaping North Korea. With a chilling demonstration of why a razor blade is important in case you were caught and would rather die than go back. Shockingly surreal in the context of a seemingly light-hearted YouTube video. Despite this, Kang says she did consider going back. 
After two years, I told my mom I wanted to go back to North Korea. She told me I could return, but that honestly, I could die on the journey. Almost eight years on, Kang says she still feels empty inside. If she had her time again, she might not have defected, citing prejudice defectors face in the South. I want South Korean people to know North Koreans aren't spongers who waste tax money. We're all Koreans after all. The South Korean government gives financial aid for rent, education, vocational training, after defectors have been through three months of training in a resettlement facility. One case in 2019 shook South Korea's conscience. A mother and son who had fled poverty and hunger in the north were found dead in their sole flat of suspected starvation. The government has been trying to improve support for those defectors most in need. While some regret their escape south, others claim they never intended to defect at all. Like Kim Ryong-hee, who says she entered China in 2011 to visit relatives and seek medical care. She claims she was tricked into coming to South Korea by a broker and is trying to get back to her husband and daughter she has only seen on video messages back in North Korea. South Koreans can only travel to North Korea in rare cases approved by both governments. I tried to make a fake passport but failed and I was jailed for 10 months. Kim is finally allowed a passport but is still banned from leaving the country. If I'm buried here, my family won't be able to come and visit my grave. If you won't let me go alive, at least let me go after I'm dead. More than 30,000 made the journey from north to south over the years, with only 30 returning in the past decade. It is a fraction, but it's also a reminder that those looking for a better life do not always find it. Paula Hancocks, CNN Seoul. And it's time to move on to Latin America. These are today's most trending stories. Patrols are being stepped up on the Chile-Bolivia border as authorities look to stem the flow of migrants crossing the desert on the back of a new immigration law which has been put in place to regulate cross-border movement. Authorities say hundreds of migrants have been detained over the last few days and will be sent back to the border with tensions between the migrants and locals coming to a head, with the migrants using public spaces to set up camp, angering residents with some of the residents blaming the newcomers for a spike in crime. Well, a trial is underway in Argentina for a Roman Catholic bishop accused of sexually abusing young men. It's just the latest case to shine light on allegations of sexual abuse, which have been rocking the church now for decades. Well, the man on trial here is Gustavo Zancheta, with claims that he preyed on young men studying at the priesthood he founded in 2016. Some 15 witnesses are set to give evidence, with the bishop expected to testify shortly. Now, as it stands, there are around 100 priests who've had allegations levelled against them in Argentina. This is according to an abuse tracking group. Moving on, and lions once roamed freely around Israel, but that certainly isn't the case today. Erica Jackson with the story. The lion is known as the king of the jungle. And while the animals once roamed the earth in the Holy Land, what happened to them? While ferocious felines like these can't be seen in the wild in modern Israel today, you could once see more of them in the Holy Land. And it's here where the majestic animals which roar had quite the reputation. The strong creatures have been a symbol of courage, power, and holiness. And they're known from their stories in the holy books, with the Hebrew Bible mentioning lions over 150 times. The significance of the lion in the Bible, the tremendous significance, has to do with its stature as the king of beasts. It's not necessarily the uh, biggest animal, but in terms of the pre being a predator, certainly the top predator. One of the holy texts where lions are mentioned as a powerful predator is the book of Daniel, which tells the famous story about Daniel when he refuses to follow a new law that people could only worship and pray to their king. Daniel is thrown into the lion's den, but despite that, he emerges unharmed. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, 
because he had trusted in his God. Another well-known story about the majestic creatures is when Judah's father Jacob blessed him and called him a lion cub, as mentioned in the book of Genesis. The tribe of Judah is compared to a lion. And that's again uh, reflecting back to the idea of the lion being the king of beasts. So because Judah was the tribe from which the royalty would emerge, so the lion has come to symbolize Judah. And that carries through even today where Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, and the symbol of Jerusalem is the lion. In Jerusalem, you might gaze at the strong creature because Jerusalem was the capital of the kingdom of Judah and home to the tribe of Judah. But lions were also at times used for something much greater, with findings at the Israel Museum, such as these lion statues in the Holy Land, shedding light on a mysterious aspect of the animal's role in society. They were part of the architecture, probably, of an ancient temple uh, in the city of Hazor, uh, around the 14th century BC. These uh, lions are, in particularly, we think that they were used as protectors, guardians of the temple. They were not just merely random decoration of the building, but actually had supernatural powers, perhaps. But the magnificent creature would meet its end here, with a significant decrease in the size of the population believed to have taken place around the time of the Crusades. And today, thousands of miles away, in India's Gir Forest, there are only several hundred Asiatic lions, the species native to Israel, which remain in the wild. But while lions became extinct in Israel, the creature with beauty and physical prowess didn't completely vanish. In fact, they're here at the Jerusalem Zoo as part of a conservation program. We have three lions at the moment. Uh, we have a, a male, a lion, and a female lioness, and their cub, which is already over one year old. The male or lion is called Gir, the female is called Yasha, and their son is called Jaya. The conservation program where lions are spread out has the goal of preventing Asiatic lions from becoming extinct in case the population faces issues including disease in places like the Gear Forest where many are located and also aims to maintain genetic diversity. But with the lack of natural habitat, the roaring question of whether Asiatic lions will ever be able to return to the wild still remains. Well, Carnival celebrations are back in the Crescent City. Mardi Gras revelers taking to the streets over the weekend in New Orleans for the first time since 2020 after the pandemic put a dampener on public celebrations last year. Plus... As one person takes flight, another found herself grounded at the gate. Mary Maloney has all of that and more in today's Take a Look at This. The floats, the costumes, the crowds, the fun and flair of Mardi Gras returning to New Orleans as the annual carnival celebration kicked off over the weekend. After COVID crushed the public festivities in 2021, revelers returning in droves to see the sights. We are hardcore Mardi Gras. And snag some beads. Tomorrow I'm going to get even more. Signs life in the Big Easy is finally returning to normal. There's no place like this city, New Orleans. Another cause for celebration, a teenager surpassing expectations. You think you're so exceptional. Well, let's see. 17-year-old Samantha Kaiser is on course to graduate from North Carolina State University this May, one of the youngest to do so in the school's history, overcoming obstacles along the way. I lived in a hotel for a month off of ramen noodles. To achieve her dreams of success. You can conquer the world just as long as you have the imagination to go after it. While one person takes flight, another finding herself grounded. We need you to go to the terminal. After being barred from boarding a flight due to alleged intoxication. You see it for hours and it's not even dreaming. Chelsea Alston allegedly fled the scene, according to newly released body cam footage. Oh man, that thing kind of goes fast. On a motorized suitcase. I have a, a bike pursuing a suitcase. The officer says Alston spit at him, the confrontation ultimately resulting in her arrest. Her attorney declined to comment. She has pleaded not guilty to all charges. For Take a Look at This, I'm Mary Maloney.
And that is all for today here on Global Eye, but feel free to catch up on the show on Facebook or on i24news.tv. We will be seeing you again tomorrow, but for now, good night.